good all the time. I was glad when they said, let's go in the house of the Lord. Thank you. God is so good to all of us. Thank you for coming here this morning. We like to welcome each and every one of you. We like to welcome them out there in the internet land. This is Pleasant Grove Missionary Baptist Church located here in Fairfield, Alabama. Our pastor is the Reverend Willie Wells, Dr. Reverend Willie Wells Jr. And he welcomes you also today. Stand on your feet today as you give praises to the Lord that he brought you here safely. Amen. God is a good God. Amen. All right, come on. Here we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You get the. Come on.
the time to stand our scripture reading coming from Matthew 21st chapter. We're going to read all together verses 1 through 11. Let us read. And when they draw now unto Jerusalem, was come unto Bega, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to the disciples, saying unto them, Go unto the village over again, and you as tied and if any man said out unto you you shall say the Lord have need of them and straightway he will send them all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying Tell ye the daughters, lie. behold, the king come to the deep. Me and the coat and the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the coat and put on their clothes and they sent him down and a very great mother too ready their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and showed them in the way. And the mother too that went before and that followed cried saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that come into the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? And the mother too said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. Let us pray. Father, we honor you and we praise you. You're so great. You're so wonderful. You're so thoughtful. You're all knowing. We just thank you because you've been so good to us. First of all, we like to slow ourselves down and say, We thank you. We praise you. We love you. Thank you, Father, for waking, waking us up this morning. Thank you, Father, for looking at us last night. Thank you, Father. And we come today putting everything that we might have into your hand. We all come with all different kind of problems. So whatever we might be going through, financial problems, marital problems, job problems, whatever it may be, Father, we come today putting it in your hand. We know that you can solve all problems. You can solve anything in the world. And so today we come asking you that we love you. And whatever we might have, we put it in your hand today. And now, Father, thank you for your universe. Thank you for just not knowing how you do things. We seen you do it as we was coming up. We seen you do it with our mothers and fathers. We don't know how they was going to make it. And now that we're in these situations today, we just see you, Father, and we praise you. We love you for working things out when it didn't look good, that you somehow put your hand up on it and it came out right. So we just come thanking you, Father. Praise you. We love you. We know we didn't come here, Father, to stay here forever. But whenever that time may come, we ask that we be with you. We come today asking for forgiveness. We have said things. We have did things. We have went places that we shouldn't have went. And we come to you and say, thank you, Father, for your mercy. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, that given us just to what we deserve. And now we come again praising you, uplifting you, saying we love you. So we ask now, Father, that you touch the sick, that you touch the bereaved, that you touch them in a mighty way, that somebody might have cancer, somebody might be going through something with sickness. We ask now that you touch them. We know that you're a doctor in a sick room, that you're a lawyer in a goat room, that you could bring us out of anything in our life. And so it's not never too late, Father. So we come to this place today, just taking our time, laying everything before you. And we know, Father, if you don't heal us, if you don't do anything, 
that you've been so great to us right now that we can praise you from now on. So we come today uplifting you, Father, praising you. And whatever we're going through, we put it in your hand. In Jesus' name, we ask of all these blessings to your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Say, I 
want to be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Gotta be where you are. I want to be where you are. Gotta be where you are. with a burden and I dare you to lay your burden at God's feet at Jesus' feet because no matter what you're going through I'm a living witness that God can work it out whatever you need is where he is if you need healing it's where he is if you need joy is if you need him to provide for you, I dare you to go to him. I dare you. I dare you to lay it at his feet. Come on, y'all. Yeah. 
my king I want to be where you are gotta be where you are I want to be where you are I gotta be where you y'all glad this morning how many you really how many you you're, you're excited this morning the lamb the lamb that was slain Jesus the Christ you may be seated in his presence as we come this morning Palm Sunday some recognize it as Passover Sunday the Passover day. It is the time where uh, Jesus drew nigh to Jerusalem. Uh, he is he is focused on where God would have him uh, to do. He is totally engulfed with the mission of the Father. His, his mind is on the world, the folks in the world. He is heavy in his heart and his physical being is under duration, stress, strain uh, he is walking in a direction knowing all the time that he is going to give his life uh, to ransom mankind from their sins their lostness he is not concerned about those that are trying to take him out. What is on his heart, he has. The people that he rode up, and the scripture says that when he rode up, uh, he looked over Jerusalem and he saw all those folks Bible says that the Passover would draw like an excess of millions of people that they would come every year for this great celebration to celebrate uh, how God gave a deliverer in the personage of Moses Moses went to Pharaoh and said to Pharaoh let my people go Pharaoh had to uh, be worn down by God 
Anybody know that God won't stop until he have his way. Pharaoh had to let them go and on that night before they left, they were told to take a lamb, one without blemish and to, uh, to kill him, to extract the blood and place the blood of that lamb over the lintel posts of the doors. God was getting ready to send the death angel down through to show Pharaoh that God is God. He's Jehovah. He is all powerful and he cannot be stopped. On that night, the families got together and and those that were waiting for the Messiah to come and and they placed that blood upon the lintel. The deaf angel came through. Those who did not know, those who were two years of younger, they were killed. The children of Israel on that morning survived because of the blood of that lamb. And they received not only gifts for the travel, but they moved out uh, depending on the God that they had failed. The God that had locked them up for 400 years in captivity. That same God that had, had to, given them uh, the necessary uh, adages to get them to the point to recognize he's God. Uh, something needs to be said about that today. That as we travel through these barren lands, that we too should never ever forget that God is God. And that no matter what you're going through and what you have gone through, uh, God is still God. He's able, he is able to pick up heads that are bowed down. They made their track and they ended uh, at the Red Sea. And it was at the Red Sea that Moses was called on again to show the miraculous power of God. And Moses took the rod that was in his hand and stretched it out. And the scripture says that the sea became open. The ground was dry. My brothers and sisters, Jesus came that we might have life. And he pulled up on Jerusalem and he saw all of those people that was coming. And out of all those millions of folks that were there, not everybody came with the right intentions. Some came just because it was a party situation. Some came because they really realized that the Messiah had come. Some came and celebrate because it was just something to do. Then there were those who came to just see how they could pick a part to deflate uh, the plan and purpose of God. And Jesus rode up and he saw them and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. The Bible says he wept. Not weeping because he couldn't do anything about it, but weeping because in his intelligence and holding on to his deity, he knew the hearts of everybody. And he knew that out of all those millions, one writer said one million, some other writer said two million. All I say was there was a whole lot of folk there. And Jesus knew every last one of them. How can you say that, Pastor? I can say that because God knows everything. God knows the hairs on your head. God knows the trouble that you are experiencing. God understands your weakness. He understands your heaviness. He understands the doubt that may creep in every now and again. He understands that you, when you want to do good, evil is always present. He knows your heart's condition. He knows the trouble that you are in. He understands where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. 
he's already made a way for that and so when he wept it didn't he was not weeping because he was out of control he wept because he saw people that would reject him the only true wise God the only one that could give him life eternally he wept because he saw that those who had come with him for such a while would betray him, would leave him, would walk away from him. He wept because he saw the persecution that would come upon the church that he would leave behind. He wept because he would see evil become even rampant. He wept because he saw even beyond the Jerusalem moment. He saw into the future. He saw that in the 21st century that there would be a pandemic that would come and almost captivate all who lived in it. He knew, he saw, he was aware, and he made some petitions for us to be able to get through it. Two and a half years, almost three years ago, we found ourselves on the front side of a pandemic. We found ourselves not knowing what it was all about, didn't understand it. The intellectuals, the medical fields had uh, thought that they had all of the right answers, but they had no answer for this pandemic and this virus that came and hit upon us and caused so much devastation of life. Jesus saw that from that vantage point when he rode up on Jerusalem. He also saw into further into our future. He saw that this pandemic, yet it would bring a lot of devastation, but it would wake up the world to know that you can't keep on carrying on the way you've been. He saw from that vantage point, he saw even the political arena becoming an upheaval. He saw that folks would even become even more afraid to take a challenge. He saw the church that would get a little bit confused about its mission. From his vantage point as he rolled up in Jerusalem, the Bible says he wept because he not only saw what he saw, but he saw what you and I see now, and he seen what you and I may not ever see. And so as today we come on this Palm Sunday, yes, to celebrate, to celebrate the Lamb, the great I Am, the Lamb that was slain, the one that had no sin who took on the sins of the world. And the Bible says that he came to us. We didn't come to him. He came to us just as we are. And so as we think today and we celebrate even in the midst of struggles, in the midst of pains, in the midst of trials and tribulation, but yet we've come this morning and there have been doubt that's crept into our arenas. There's been fear that's been trying to grab hold to us. But we've come this morning because he came. Not only did he come, but he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. The Bible says that he got in our place. Jesus wept then. Let's not allow our weeping to be to fall on deaf soil. For our tears and our, our times of trouble, our times of sorrow, it's all for the advancement of the kingdom of God. God is with us and he's directing us and nothing will cause us to fail as long as we stay with him. So on this Palm Sunday, we come not realizing where we are going, where we've been, but we come in the moment and we thank God 
for his grace and his mercy. Today, I want to revisit what Reverend Johnson uh, started us out this morning masterfully uh, with our worship service. I want to go back and grab hold to a couple of verses of what he read from Matthew, the 21st chapter, uh, that verse 1 through 11. I want to go in and catch a couple of verses that would kind of get us to our preaching moment, and that is in verse 4 and 5. You'll see that in verse 4 and 5, and I know that you're already seated today, and uh, you can remain seated, but in your spirit, be alert. In other words, in your spirit, be alive and stand up in your spirit to receive the word of God because it, it is the word of God that when everything else is said and done, it is God's word that gives us that keep on keeping on power. Can I get a witness? All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a coat the fold of an ass. That's enough. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for this solemn but privileged moment that we come, having come through what we've gone through, and you've allowed us to arrive to this point, and we're thankful. Our minds and our hearts are elated we are so at peace with you, O oh God, because of what you've done for us. So now, Lord, you have our attention here today. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Let your spirit fall afresh upon us. Bring into our midst, Lord, your miraculous presence. Not only inhabit our thoughts, but inhabit our praise. Use us now as we decrease, you increase. Have your way, O oh God. You are the potter. Certainly we are the clay. Mold us now. We need to be molded. Shape us now, Lord, into your likeness. Help us to understand that everything that you allow us to go through is to grow us and to cause our witness to be stronger. Have your way with us now, Lord. We yield to you afresh today. And we ask it all in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Shout amen. amen. Come on, shout it out. Amen. Do it one more time. Amen. 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 Uh, happy uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, to our preacher who is here today, Johnson, and to uh, other preachers who are off and um, then to our officers who are here today, and to all of you God's children here, and then those that may be online, uh, we greet you in the joy of Jesus. He is the only hope that we have uh, for our lives. Every situation that we have, we can find hope in Jesus. And whatever you're going through, uh, it was because you had hope in him that you were able to get through it. And those who did have hope in him and God let them get through it anyhow, they ought to be shown up thankful for his grace and his mercy, his grace unmerited favor, amen, his mercy that didn't give us what we rightly deserve. And I thank God for uh, his presence in our lives. Today, I won't talk from this subject uh, as we have not left our uh, emphasis on moving towards hope, this is another one of those just with a different uh, attitude subject-wise. I won't talk to you uh, from this subject. He did it liberately. He did it. He did it deliberately. 
Let's say it again. He did it deliberately. Uh, he, in other words, he did it on purpose. When you think about the word deliberate, it is something that you do without hesitation. It is, it is what happened when Will Smith uh, a few weeks ago uh, at a thing called an Oscar, uh, that one moment he was sitting uh, laughing at the jokes told by uh, the Chris um, Rock. And all of a sudden, uh, he changed and he deliberately stood from his chair, walked with his head lifted, and walked towards where Chris Rock was standing. And he didn't reach all the way back, but he reached back enough. And he had his mind made up because he was deliberate in his execution. And he didn't get to the point like Abraham did with that with that knife in his hand, getting ready to take the life of his child, Isaac. And when he reached back and came down, God stopped him, and he heard over in the thicket a ram. Now, God was deliberate in his action, and Will Smith was deliberate in his action, and he slapped him. He turned around, and he went back to his seat, and he deliberately did this. He cussed from his seat those words about keeping his wife's mouth, name out of the mouth. He did all of that deliberately. My brothers and sisters, all of us have been involved in some events in our lives, at some points of our lives, where we did something deliberately. We, we may have said something uh, and we had our mind made up that we were going to say it and we didn't care who was there and what the place was. We deliberately said it. Some not only here and there, but some of us have been in situations where we did something deliberately. We were there because we planned it, and we would not be thwarted in our plans, and we did it. And then there are some that not only said something deliberately, did something deliberately, but there was some that thought some things deliberately. And, but our Lord Trump all of that. He deliberately came so that we might have life. He did it on purpose. Nobody made him do it. In fact, in the midst of time, he saw what we have seen from the scriptures that there were going to be a whole lot of folk that would deliberately leave him, forget about him, not disown him. But even in that, he made up in his mind, make me a body, and I'll go down and save my people from their sins. Everything that our Savior does, he does it deliberately. He doesn't hesitate. He does it purposely. In fact, he does it just on time. Can I get somebody this morning that you didn't understand how today would turn out? But one thing you had purposed in your heart that I'm going to church. And, and I mask and all that, I'm going to church. You made a deliberate effort to be here, and because of your attitude, God allowed you to get here. 
Somebody says, well, I'm not there. I'm here. I'm at, the, I'm at my house. You woke up this morning because God deliberately in his mind touched you early this morning with his finger of love. He didn't have to call a counsel about it. He did it deliberately. I mean, he didn't have to pray about it. He knew that he would touch you this morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he touched me and woke me up this morning. And not complaining about anything. Whatever you've gone through this morning, God let you get here. And God didn't sit back and try to work on it. God planned it before you were even born, before I was even thought about in my mama's and daddy's mind. He got together with the Father and the Holy Ghost, and the Scripture says that he deliberately made time be. And here we are. Who would have thought it that after all that we've been through, that we would see another Palm Sunday in a different way that we've ever seen it before. Easter is going to be next week if God let us see it. It's going to be different this year. Different in the sense that the topography, the layout ain't nothing like it used to be. It won't ever go back to that. But can, it can become aggressively better. The new norm is going to be better than the old norm. Your new life situation is going to be better than your old life. Make sure you're in Christ walking in his way. And the scripture tells us today that as we navigate these shores, we don't know how things are going to work out. But one thing we know, we serve a deliberate God that does everything deliberately. Amen. And so I want to talk about that today, and I want to encourage us to understand, don't get mixed up in the, in the, the message, mixed up in, in the, the, I call the commerciality that has attached itself uh, to the spiritual uh, positions of salvation through a savior named Jesus. First of all, I see him doing things, and the scripture says that he, he, he came to Jerusalem. He deliberately entered Jerusalem. He entered Jerusalem on purpose. Now, when you think about before he got to Jerusalem, he did something that was noteworthy and earth-shaking. Jesus, in the portals of his royal regalness, Jesus, in, in the presence of the, the triune head, God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Jesus, the scripture says, deliberately, dispatched himself down to a place called earth through 42 generations Lord have mercy came down through the worst lineage that you could even imagine but he came down through it to show the world that I love you so much God says that I give you my only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And here you see Jesus. He deliberately comes to that place called a Bethlehem manger. Can y'all see him? He's in a Bethlehem manger. He's a little bit old infant. He's a little bit old baby. He's goo-gooing and gogging, and there's no room for him in the ends. The people are all sold out, but they're not sold out to him. They're all caught up with the festivities of that time, 
and Jesus came down. Y'all don't miss this. Jesus came down. The scripture said deliberately that little baby that God himself that allowed him to come into a womb of a girl named Mary and she became espoused to Joseph and when that time for him to be delivered into the earth, the scripture says he was there in a trough that was being drank from by animals because there was no room. Today, as we think about how Jesus deliberately uh, dispatched his body in a Bethlehem manger, is there any room for him in your own life? Are we crowded out? Are we sold out? Or are we crowded out? Have we done the Daniel syndrome that we're going to serve God, whether we're in Jerusalem or in Bangladesh, whether we're in the good or the bad, we're not only going to serve him, but we're going to pray and we're going to seek his faith and we're going to be his children. And we're going to magnify his name. Aren't you glad that Jesus deliberately came to that Bethlehem manger? Because after he was dispatched to that Bethlehem manger, you find himself, he finds himself there in Jerusalem. He gets to Jerusalem, but not in the way that we would think about it. He didn't come to Jerusalem in the way that folks were looking for him. Watch the text. In verse 1, the Bible says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, they are Jesus and the disciples. They are traveling. Remember, they are coming to, to, to show forth. They don't understand it. He does. He's coming to show the world that I am that I am that I am that I am. I'm a rock in a weary land. I, I am I am before time. I'm in time. I'm on time. I am that I am. I am. I am now. I am then and I am later on. I am. It may sound ebonic, but what Jesus said, I'm, I, I know who I am. And y'all going to be confused about who I am because you think that I'm coming to take down the Roman rule. But I didn't come to take down the Roman rule. I came down to take down sin. And he says, look at the verse, look at verse one again. Y'all see it? He says that, uh, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, Jesus and the disciples, and were come to Bethphage. Before they got to Jerusalem, Bethphage was a place that they hung out before that moment he rolled up that we're in right now celebrating had to rest. He had to do some things. Watch this. This is so important for you to know and never forget that Jesus wasn't riding in on twenties. Jesus wasn't diamond in the back sunroof top, digging the scene with the gangster lean. Ooh, ooh. He wasn't driving Lexuses and he wasn't driving Bentleys and he wasn't driving those things that we drive. He didn't
culture, when they rolled up on a stallion, they came in a battlement mindset. Jesus didn't come to battle man. Jesus didn't come to battle those, those different groups of people. Jesus didn't even come to battle the Roman Empire. Jesus came as the king, but he came as the king of peace. When you see him riding up in that lamb, he deliberately got on that coat and rolled up on top of Jerusalem to dispatch his lowliness, his peace. And I think when we think about the scripture, when we look at Matthew, the eighth chapter, verse 20, it says that, and Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. When you think about Jesus deliberately entered into Jerusalem, he came not caught up with the materiality of life at that time. And I need to hasten to this point and say to us, stop magnifying stuff over him. Stop seeking material things. In Matthew 6, 30, 6, 33 says, says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these other things will be what? Added unto you. Anybody in this place on the airways know that when you put God's business first, God will take care of your business. When you make God your first choice, Whatever you're standing in need of, whenever you need it, God will bring it. Can I get a witness? Whatever it is, no matter what it is you're standing in need of, when you put God's business first, when you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things, because other things won't make you have peace. Other things won't make your life fulfilled. Other things will not bring you the satisfaction that you really need. But when you seek him, he will give you joy, unspeakable joy. He'll give you hand clapping moments even when your bills are unpaid when your health has plummeted, when your life seems to be out of array, when things seem to be coming against you, is there anybody in this room this morning know that the joy of the Lord is my strength? I'm making it not because I got stuff. I'm making it because I got Jesus. And he is enough. Our society, our culture, no matter what it is, and there are many cultural views in life right now, is always get more and more and more. And I approve it. One or two pair of shoes should be enough. And back in the day, if we had a pair of play shoes and a, and a pair of uh, church shoes. And in some of our camps, uh, our play shoes were our church shoes and vice versa. How many shoes can you put on one foot at a time? Somebody said, I can't put on one, but I sure would like to be able to open up my, my wardrobe and see what I can choose. Nothing wrong with the material thing when you got it. Whole lot of wrong with it when it got you. Jesus comes and he says he's lowly. He comes to the Bethlehem manger and he finds himself in Jerusalem and he's, he's, he's showing the lowliness, the humility, the meekness of him. He who is God. But he comes as the king bearing peace. 
and he did it deliberately. Aren't you glad today? Aren't you glad today? Aren't you excited today that God didn't give you and I what we righteously deserved? Uh, <laughs> I know sometimes we think because we got, we got it going on, we look good, hair hitting right, clothes right, yard looking right, car doing right, think you got it right, got a little piece of change. You think that you own your own, but all of us were sinners headed to hell. And I don't know about you, I'm excited that God looked past my faults and deliberately saved me. And, and material things are not what we seek after. Uh, the psalmist says, my heart panteth after you, O Lord. And he says, as the deer panteth for water, so ought our souls, our hearts, the whole embodiment of our being to seek after, thirst after him. When you thirst after him and do it deliberately, God knows how to quench your thirst. Is there anybody ever been having a, had a physical thirst and you got a good cold glass of ice water and it, and it quenched your thirst? Maybe you were out doing yard work or out cleaning the car or in your house cleaning the house or maybe doing some type of recreational stuff and you got, so listen, sometimes Coke is all right, sometimes, but this is something about good cold water, man, that can quench the thirst. But the problem is with that, that cold water has to be uh, taken in often. Oh, but he told that woman at the well, if you drink of this water in this well, you're going to have to do it often. But if you drink of this water that I have, it'll become a well spring gushing out of you. The materiality of life is not our mandate. If you don't have but one this or one that, wear it. it. Whatever you got, be thankful for it. Jesus didn't come to save the wealthy only. He came to save the lost. And when I think about what life brings us, it brings us an array of things. But what it cannot take from us is that joy that God has given us. You're here today and things are not as well as you want it to be. You're there today and it may not be like you planned it, but aren't you glad this morning that God deliberately gave you another day, just another day, just one more day, one more day, one day I have not seen before and shall never see it again. Jesus deliberately entered into Jerusalem. But my brothers and sisters, the scripture doesn't stop there because in verse 2 and 5 of our text, it says that he deliberately fulfilled the prophecy. Yeah, when we think about he did it deliberately, God tells us that he did it deliberately when it came to the prophecy. That prophecy was all about us having eternal life. Notice verse, verse 20. Notice verse 4. Verse 4 says, all this was done that it might be fulfilled. What might be fulfilled? That, that the prophecy, that which was talked about, which was spoken by the prophet saying. What did he say? You're asking a good question. This is what he said in verse 5. Tell ye the daughter of Zion. That's nobody but Jerusalem. That to tell the Israelites, tell them that behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Guess what he says. Last week we talked about John, and John the Baptist was preaching the entrance of Jesus coming to take over our lives so that we would have life eternally. And he was, while he was preaching, he saw Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb that would be slain, the great I Am. And he said, Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. 
And here in our text today, we see that Jesus deliberately fulfilled the prophecy. And the Bible says, tell, tell ye the daughters of Zion, behold, thy king coming unto thee, but he coming not the way you looking for him. Can I tell you, everything that glitters is not really gold. Sometimes the grass is really not greener on the other side. I heard somebody give an analogy about that. Say, if you want some green grass like they got on the other side, get your water and some fertilizer and go on and nourish your grass where you are. Because you don't know what folks doing on that side to get their grass green. And you don't know what they got to continue to do to keep it green. But if you put Jesus in your heart and allow him to flourish through your life, he would make your life full and fabulous. I say full and fabulous. And when I look at the text here, the scriptures tell us that he's not coming to destroy the Roman government. That's what they were looking for. They, their four parents had been talking to them about, hey, the Messiah going to come. It, the fact wasn't that they weren't talking about the Messiah, but they weren't, they weren't talking about him in the way that he would come. They wanted him to come to destroy the Roman government because the Roman government had them on the lock. They couldn't even, to, in, in fast forward, they couldn't even kill Jesus until they got the the permission from the Roman government, and they were sick of it. And I told somebody a couple of three weeks ago, won't somebody tell the governor of Alabama that the president of the United States is not running for the office of governor of Alabama? And she got a gun and she's shooting. I know I'm, I'm political right now. That, that's not what the issues are. Listen, Jesus came, he came meek. The scripture said meek. It, he had to be meek to be able to take on all of our sins. He had to be not only meek and humble, mild, to take on my mess. I don't know about your mess. But my mess, I, I got enough mess in my life, and I had enough junk in my closet. But it, it take, all of us got it. And he had to be meek, lowly, and mild to take that which he didn't do himself, but to take it upon himself so that you and I could have life mm, eternally with him. And it doesn't make any difference where you are in life, the Lord will take you where you are and have you to start and have you to go to heights that you can't even imagine. When I think about the text, he says, tell them that your king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass and a coat, the foal of an ass. Christ sent two disciples into the city when he came. Somebody said, you're moving fast forward. There I am because I already told you that when he rode on that ass, it did not show that he was without power. What it did show was that he has all power, even before the crucifixion, but he came not to exemplify that power of judgment. He came to exemplify that power of forgiveness. And ain't that a blessing today? Man, aren't you glad God don't judge us in the way that he should? but rather he forgives us. Jesus was on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He deliberately forgave us. And the least we can do is deliberately forgive somebody else. Whether they say it or not, just, just listen, just forgive folks. Don't, don't let folks go to the grave and have you following them to the grave. Forgive people, and you ought to be those kind of people that don't go around with anniversary dates on what people have done to you. Because when I think about what we've done to him, the least we can do is forgive somebody, whether they are worthy of it or not. Just forgive them. I don't want to spend my days left on earth worrying about 
somebody that got a grit in their crawl for me. The scripture says that Christ sent two disciples into the city. Can you see Jesus working out the plan of God? He sends two disciples into the city. Matthew 21 and 1 said, then sent Jesus two disciples. Y'all see that? Here's a thought that I want you to keep in mind about that. When Christ sends two disciples into the city, please hear this this morning, that every mission of the Lord, every mission, every plan that God will in, embark us in, every mission, every task, every job, no matter how small it is, is important. And you got to say amen. No job, no task, no mission that God gives you and I to do for him is minimal or is minor. Whatever it is that God allows you and I to do, it is no matter how small you may have brought it down to, but it is important if it was important to him. When I think about ministry, ministry, people want to get in their lights. You know, they can't serve until they get the big lights. They can't serve if they ain't the preacher. They can't serve if they're not the pastor. They're not the deacon. They're not in the lay leadership part of it. No, when God saved us, forget about these other uh, positions that have been placed upon us. Nothing would ever trump the fact that God saved you and I not to just hold high pro positions in, in church, but to be servants of the Most High God. All of us can be servants, and, and the lowliness of, of people will be the servant of those who need serving. And when I think about this, it was very critical and important in, in, in the proclamation of Christ as king. It, you may not thought, think that it was much for those two men to go out and to go and do something that Jesus told them to do, and, and they, they did not fuss about it. And when I think about the missions that God put us on, how much time do we spend arguing with God about what he wants us to do? We spend more time talking about praying about it. I've always come to this point. When a person, God has asked somebody to do something, and they talk about I got to pray about it, no, that's an excuse not to do it. We used to have business meetings that was were hellacious in, in my home church, in my first church of pastoring, and in this church. And boy, man, people, man, people would come and cut up in them business meetings. They thought maybe that's, that's what we, listen, we come to raise, you know what. And now that, that wasn't the issue. That's not the issue with Christ. He tells us that we have been, we have been commissioned to work in mission. And no matter how small and minute it is, do it because the Lord has summoned you. And just think how bad it would be if there were nobody that would clean the bathrooms. Mm. Just think how bad it would be. Remember when that two year span of time, especially the first year of the pandemic, that you couldn't go to the dentist because they were closed. Your hygienist didn't make house calls. And he or she probably wouldn't have come in away because they're afraid of catching COVID. All of our mouths were jacked up. My wife told me one day, she said, uh, uh, uh. So that's why I started wearing my mask religiously, deliberately. Just think about if we didn't have people that do those minor things, just think that if the gas man that bring that big truck and dump that gas in these different areas didn't come. You have a pretty shiny thing. Stand still. You who want a brand new car, you got to put your, I mean, you got to put your reservation in. Because God allowed that chip, not the motor, not the tires, listen, not the wheels, not the interior, but that chip. And when you go to these car dealerships, 
you have no array of cards to choose from because of that chip. You better hear Jesus. And now they came on this morning and said, baby formulas are a shortage. That was no problem for me. Mama used to crush up the greens and the, and the cornbread, and she chew it up in her mouth and put it in my mouth. You just got to learn how to navigate through it. Jesus deliberately, the scripture says, second point there, Jesus deliberately came to where we were to fulfill the prophecy. And when I think about that, not only did Christ send the two descended the two disciples out to receive, retrieve what he had already prophetic talked about. And he sent them out by two. And I need to say something about that because that's important. God didn't send you into this world to be by yourself. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's been gifted to marry. If you hadn't been gifted to be married, don't marry. There are some people have, he has gifted to be single, and if you've been gifted to be single for that time, don't try to marry. But God put us, always give us two by two so that we can work it out. Now, I know that some parents, some, some spouses are going on, but God didn't leave you alone. Two by two. God, there's something when two folks are working towards a plan, it makes it a little bit more reachable than for one person to do it. Christ had a reason for making such detailed uh, preparation to enter Jerusalem. And Zechariah tells us about it even before it, he did this in the ninth chapter in verse 9. Notice what Zechariah says. He said, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Now, Zechariah is talking about prophetic things that will come in the future. And Jesus, at the point of our text, is now bringing it to fruition. He says he is just and having, and, and having salvation. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the foal of an ass. Coming to king, but bearing peace. First, the donkey was symbolizing Christ was king. Secondly, the donkey represented peace. The peace that Christ offers includes three, two things. One is spiritual peace. He brings spiritual peace. Not, not bringing you physical peace first, because if you get physical peace and don't have spiritual peace, you still miserable. Say it again, preacher. You can have all of the physical peace that you, you can even think about, but if you don't have spiritual peace, let me make the difference here and talk about it. Spiritual peace rests for your soul. Oh, the hell is bust loose in my life, but I got peace in my soul. Oh, they're tearing up all around me, but I got peace in my soul, free from the guilt of sin. How many of you can shout this morning in spite of, but knowing that your sin has been blotted out and that makes you have joy. Sharice was trying to sing her song. That's her song that she was singing, that she was trying to sing this morning. Don't know what's going on with it, but we know the path that she has traveled. And we don't know what's going on with her. We'll never know how she feel. But one thing we know, that she ain't letting it stop her. Can I get somebody? And it says, it says very important and with an exclamation point, that when you can't do what you used to do, do what you can do. Don't be crying about what you can't do. Do what you can do. And when you do what you can do to the glory of God, then he gives you peace in your soul that you can rejoice when the music ain't playing. And you can shout when the preacher ain't hooping. And you can walk when folks ain't talking right. And you can lay on the, on the personage of God when everybody else have let you down. Is there anybody this morning know that the peace that I have, it ain't from the world. It comes from him, and it's down in my soul. One day I was washed, lost in sin, 
seeking to rise no more. Very deeply staying within. Yeah, I said seeking to rise no more. But the master heard my cry from the waters. He lifted me. Now safe am I. What was it? Who was it? It was love. Who loved? God's love that came down and deliberately lit upon me. Aren't you glad this morning that when nobody else loves you, God loves you even in your mess? Hallelujah. Then, then, then there is what I call today uh, practical peace. Spiritual peace is rest from your soul, free from the guilt of sin. Amen. Spiritual comfort and eternal security. Uh, but, but practical peace is peace with other folk. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, mm, that one's going to take a minute. The scripture says, live peaceably as possible with all men. Now, when I read that so many years ago and rehearsed it in my life and then went and checked it out, that says to me that there's some folk you just ain't going to be able to fool with. What do you do in that case? You shake, oh my God, you shake the dust off your feet and you keep moving on. You're not going to let Pookie them and Ray Ray them charter your course for your life. Because there's some folks you can try to please and whatever you do, they never ever going to be satisfied. You ain't talking to me. That you can go in and hawk all of your material things and give it to them and they going to still find something wrong with what you give. If you give them $100, they're going to cry and say, why you didn't give me 150 If you give them a $1 million, and they're going to say, why you didn't give it into this, this denomination. If you go to extra mile with them, they're going to say, well, why are you here? Why are you hanging around? So that's just some folks in life you're not going to be able to deal with. And when you can't, put them in the hands of the Lord and you keep on living life the best you can. That should be an amen right there. Practical peace, that is trying to be at peace with folks. I've discovered this, and I hope you do today that sometimes you got to compromise not your view, not your value, not your Christian value. Sometimes you got to learn just for the peace sake. You just got to learn. You ain't got to have the last word. You just got to learn to compromise. If, if the heater is too hot, find a medium. Just got to compromise. If you, if you like chips and she like um, chips, ice cream with her chips, uh, just buy some ice creams and some chips. If, if she likes Barbara and you, likes, you like public, just buy public and Barbara. Amen. If you like sleeping on the right side of the bed, and you're in a hotel room because you're on a travel, and uh, she gets on the right side, you on the left side, but you've been driving all day, it don't make any difference. Put me at the head, the bottom. If I'm tired, just let me lie down in the bed. I'm not going to lose my mind because I can't have what I like. I'm just going to be happy with what I got. Whoo, I'm preaching up in here and ain't nobody shouting. I'm not going to worry about you talking about what I don't have and what I can't have. I'm just going to thank God for what I got. Amen. I'm not going to that apparel store and pick up something because I want you to be excited about how I look on me. No, I don't even care how I look on the mannequin. If I go in and it looks good on me, I'm satisfied. And if you talk about it, then you go by what you think will make me look good. And I'll take it 
and go trade it in and get the money because I bought what I wanted. And I like what I like. And Jesus come up and them folk, listen, them Herodians, they mad at him. I mean, they want to get him out of there. You don't see Jesus worrying about them Herodians. And then them Pharisees, oh, they, they, they mad with him because he come on talking about, I am that I am. And they, they had the notoriety. You didn't see him getting all flustered about them. No, he knew that they were jealous of him because he knew what the Father had sent him to do. You will miss a whole lot of uh, mess in your life if you just do what he says to do. Tell your neighbor, I'm on that point. And when I think about this, that leads me to he deliberately received the homage of the disciples. Homage is just another word of uh, praise and reverence. Uh, he received homage uh, from, uh, of the disciples. And when I think about that word, the acts of homage towards Christ, the, here it is, and it's going to help us out today when we think about Jesus riding up on that day called Palm Sunday when we think about how he deliberately did it without any coercion for us. Acts of homage towards Christ is what you need, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get you, and it is obey. It is obedience. It acts towards Christ of homage is obedience. How can you make God happy? How can Jesus be excited about you is when you do what he says to do. Obedience. Lord, have mercy. Look at the sixth verse of chapter 21. And the disciples went. Yeah, the two, the two, the two that he sent out, two, so they could encourage one another. The disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. That could be the issue of a lot of problems in lives of people with mental health. And I'm not saying that folks that are having mental health is because they, they just done lost it some years. That's a, listen, life, if you're trying to handle it by yourself, will throw you into a mental health crisis. Life, if you take everything and the weight of it and try to hold it on yourself, you can find yourself in a mental health crisis. If you're looking at the world and listening to the radio and listen to the commentators and listen to what's going on and look at the folks in your neighborhood and see how the political arena is all in upheaval, to see how all the devastation, to see the crime and see the murderous activity and see the wars going on. And if you try to carry all that on your own abilities and self, it can throw you into a mental Christ situation. Oh, but when they get too heavy for you, God bless America. Cast your cares upon him. And the Bible takes it, and when you look at it from the Greek, it says, throw them. Listen, let them go. Let him handle that that you can't handle. When I think about these two, obedience, obedience. And my brothers and sisters, John, the 14th chapter, verse 21 helps us out even more. He that... He that, he that hath my commandments, listen to that, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, not only know them, but keepeth them, and not only keep them, he it is that loveth me. To just have the Bible, just to know the grandeur of what God, who God is enough to be saved, but to never act that out, never be a witness. He said, look this here. He says that he said, it is, it is, he, it is that he loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. I, I just need, I need to lead that verse up there and help you out a little bit. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. Got to say something right there. He's not saying that, that the father got to have some conditions to love you. What he's saying is, it's pertaining to you. He says that in the last part, he says, he says, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. God loved you and I to the 
fullest, even before time was. He deliberately loved us and loves us now. Don't leave out here thinking that, oh, I got to go to the right church or I got to do these um, practical things to get God to love me. You, God, God don't need nothing from you and I to love us. He loved us by his own experience that if you and I would have been the only one, he still would have come. And saved us. That's how much he loved us. You know how much he loved us? He loved us this much. And that's the best I can do with my limitation. He loves. He got the whole world in his hand because he loved the whole world. He wished no man perish. So when I think about this deliberate actions of God, watch this, y'all, because this will bless you today when we think about obedience. But not only that, giving him the best we have proves our homage to him. He deliberately received the homage of the disciples. Remember, before Jesus got to that moment, he wasn't letting them do none of that. He was saying, my, my hour has not come. But his hour has come, and he's letting them lavishly. And he's not up on himself. He's want them to let other folks know, I am the one that they've been talking about. And you know, when you give God your best, Man, God is excited. He is excited. And I'm not just talking about money, but I am talking about money. I'm talking about everything that you and I have. And Psalms 24 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world that dwell therein. We don't own anything. We're just caretakers of. But God wants us to give him his best, and that shows homage. That shows reverence. Do I have anybody here this morning that, that God, God, you've been obedient to him and you don't mind, you give him, Lord, here my whole being is. Lord, have me have, like you desire me. Don't put things somewhere. Give God the best. Every time I preach a message, I'm giving him my best. I don't care whether I get amens or not. I'm giving him my best. I ain't doing it to get brownie points. I'm doing it because he's teaching me how to love him. Give him your best. Don't give him second rate. Don't give him that, that second rate type stuff. Give him your best. Whatever you do in life, whatever ministry you work in church, give him your best best. Whatever you do for him, whether it's in the church, outside of the church, give him your best. Don't come with all kinds of conclusions and concerns about what you can't do. Just give him your best. When you giving him your best, then you can hear him say, well done. Your best is not measured upon other folks' best. Your best is measured upon what you're able to do. Give him your best. When you've done all you can do, you'll hear him shout, amen, and servant, well done. So many times we get caught up trying to do somebody else's best. Just give him your best. And when you give him your best, he is appreciative of it. When I think about that, Matthew the 7th, uh, 7 verse, verse 27, verse chapter 21 says, and they brought the ass and the coat and they put on them their clothes and they set him thereon and put on them their clothes on the ass and the coat. Very important. That you not take your clothes off because that's what they were doing and that was a sign of reverence there. And that was homage that Jesus received. He didn't stop him from doing that. But, but he was more important getting us to see this. It's not your clothes. It's really not your money. It's not your talents. It's not your gifts. It's your heart. He don't want your gifts. He don't want your talents. He don't want the little money that he's given you. He wants your 
heart. Because when he gets your heart, he got your wallet. When he gets your heart, he got your best. When he gets your heart, you'll tell the folks in the club, can't fool with you tonight. Got to call it on my life. When he gets your heart, you won't fuss about your name wasn't spelled right. When he gets your heart, you wouldn't care if they don't mention you at all. You'll just be a backdoor worker. If when he gets your heart, it makes no difference who gets the credit. When he gets your heart, you won't let the rain stop you from coming. Oh, Lord, when he gets your heart, because she done got up and gone and he gone and, don't, and left you alone. But when he got your heart, you know that you ain't alone. When he got your heart, you know that you seen the thunder. You heard the thunder rolling, seen the lightning flashing. But he promised never to leave you, never to leave you alone. When God gets your heart, can't nobody break your heart no more. Lord, have mercy. They may leave you. They may throw rocks at you, but they can't break the heart because God will put a, put a shield around your heart. Isn't it amazing that what they used to say about you almost tore you up from the floor up, but now they can call you whatever they want to call you because God done wrapped up your heart. And you said, talk to the, talk to the hand because the head ain't listening. When God got your heart, Nobody won't have to make you praise him. When God got your heart, you don't need no music. You don't need no pulpit. You just need to have breath in your lungs and tell the Lord, I was glad <laughs> when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. One more time, one more time. When God got your heart, he got you. Can I get a witness? Clap your hands right there to the Lord. And so when I think about this, he deliberately received the homage from the people. And they, they, the multitude did two things. They received him as king. They received him as king. And then they received him as Messiah. Verse 8 says they received him as king because they spread their garments out. See that in that text? They spread their garments out, verse 8. They spread their garments out, and they cut down branches from the tree. They received him as king. They just didn't know that he wasn't going to be the king that destroyed the Roman. He was going to be the king that would bring peace and bring about salvation. My brothers and sisters, he to receive him as the Messiah in Matthew 21, 9 says, and the multitude that went before and followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, I just discovered that you may not be loud like me, but if he got your heart and he didn't save you, you ought to be able to shout somewhere. You ought to be able to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You ought to be loud about your conviction. You ought not to be ashamed about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You ought to be loud and bodacious and braggadocious about a man named Jesus that came down from heaven and died and rose the third day morning that you might have life and life abundantly. You need to say not only Hosanna, but then blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Lord, Hosanna in the highest. That's because Jesus deliberately received the homage of the people. And that's what we should be doing, praising God. As I conclude today, you notice the deliberate question and response in Jerusalem. When Jesus shows up, he's going to always cause some talking to go on. Yeah, even today when he shows up, folk going to get to talking. Some people talk at all kinds of talk, but notice the text here in the verse 10. Verse 10 says, and when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. I mean, everybody, every lolly, every dotty, they were talking. Man, when Jesus showed up, here it is. This, some of them looked at him, that's Mary's, yeah, boy. That's Mary, Joseph, and them boy, that's that carpenter. But then Psalm says, behold the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. 
The Herodians said, uh-uh, we ain't finna let you take our thunder no more. The Pharisees, oh, no, you're not going to come in and get on our thunder no more. Then there are others saying, we don't care what you say. We come for him. We are, we're looking for him. And now we have him, and we are going to honor him. They were talking. A lot of folks talking. Today, we look at this Palm Sunday. We're getting ready to go into Easter. That's next week, y'all. Is it next week? Is it next week? Is it Easter already? Well, you know what? People are talking about what they're going to do, what kind of services, churches are planning, concerts and all that. Ain't nothing wrong with that. People are talk- But then there's some people talking about what they are not going to do, now, not going to church, not going to talk about no Jesus, don't want to hear nothing about no Jesus. I'm going to party by myself. I'm just going to take my mask off. And I'm going to go in and have a good time. I'm going to eat, sleep, and be merry. Folks are talking, but not all people are talking the right kind of talk. And the church has lost its talking ability. Yeah, we talk about what we got, but we don't talk about who gave it to us. Yeah, we talk about how we were sick, but we don't tell the folks about who it was that made us whole. Yeah, we talk about how I got my education. I'm sorry, educators. He said, but, but we don't talk about who it was that gave you breath in your body. Who it was that gave you intellect? Who it was that gave you not, not the stumbling moments, but gave you a resonant way so that you can do what he had called you to do? They were talking. And they said, who is this? That's the question. And when somebody asks you about who it is that helped you through that time when your spouse died, who was it that got you through it? Thank God for the groups of folks and other groups and, you know, those health ministries that come in. Thank God for that. But ultimately, when a spouse done lost a spouse, and I don't know how it is to feel that way and I ain't looking forward to that. But when a spouse loses a spouse, aren't you glad that he'll be a father, he'll be a mother, he'll be a husband, he'll be a wife for those who don't have. Can I get a witness? And they were talking. That's what we need to talk. Who is it? Who it was that saved you? Who it is that keeps you right? Who it is that caused you to be moving in the direction that you? His name is Jesus. Verse 11 says, and the multitude said, this is the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And so the naysayers were asking, who is this? And God always keeps a remnant. Uh, One one songwriter says, what is this that make me shout when I should be crying? What is this that makes my head lift up when I should be bowing? Whatever it is, Whatever it is, it won't let you hold your peace. Hold, hold your peace. No, we got to hold our peace and shoot our witness gun. Why you keep on preaching that Jesus preacher? Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. Why you keep on hollering about there's no way other than Jesus? Because he deliberately came down 42 generations. The Bible says deliberately. Nobody made it. He did it on purpose and landed in the Bethlehem manger. And almost 12 years of his life in a place preaching to dry, dusty rabbis. And they said, Lord, our heart burning here. We ain't never heard it like this before. And the scripture says, that Thursday night, oh my God, he deliberately allowed himself to go in from judgment hall to judgment hall. And when I think about that, how he deliberately did that, the least I can do is tell his story. Because his story is my story. And on Friday, there he is. Can't you see him? 
walking with your cross and taking it, marching it up, Golgotha's here, beaten, battered, I mean, just dogged out. But he kept on marching. And Lord, he got to the point his physical man broke down and God always keeps a ram in the bush. And there he comes and he gets up under that cross with Jesus and helps him to that place. But he does not stop. Jesus continues to move. He deliberately climbs that mountain with that heavy cross on his shoulder. They get him up on top of Mount Calvary and they nail his hands, feet, lifteth him high. And he could have called down all the angels. He could have called down all hell and brimstones. He could have called down, but he deliberately allowed that moment to happen because he loved us so much. Can you see him? He's up there. He's hanging. He's up high. He lifted out wide, and the scripture says he dropped low, and there they are gambling for his garments. They are materialistic in their mind. They have no room for him. They're wagging their tails and their hands at him. And he says one thing, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then he, before he gave up the ghost, he says, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. He deliberately came. He deliberately hung. He deliberately died. And right early Sunday morning, he deliberately rose. And we don't have to wait till next week to sing up from the grave he arose. Every day ought to be that song in our hearts. Up from the grave. He arose. When I think about this, you maybe you're here today and maybe you're on the airwaves and you've been doing a whole lot of things in a deliberate way. You've been deliberately walking away from the opportunities that God has given you. You've been deliberately ignoring the message of the gospel. You've been deliberately rejecting Jesus. But he deliberately came to you to move you from your sinful state. And all he want you to do is deliberately receive him. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe that you deliberately came to get in my place. Lord Jesus, by faith I receive you. Save me from my sinful life. And I know I got some witnesses here today that you've already done that and he saved your life. He didn't hesitate. He came purposely on purpose to save you. And if that's your plight today and you never received him, I want to offer Christ to you today. He, he, he will deliberately come to your life and save you. We offer Christ to you today. I'm going to ask you to stand in this place, wherever you are on the airways. You deliberately receive him. We offer all Christ to you. Brother, oh, we, we, we are for Christ to you. He deliberately came. Won't you deliberately come to him? My sister, he rode upon an ass coat. The ass was to symbolize his peace. Salvation will bring peace in our life. This peace I give to Jesus is not like the world, but this peace comes from me. I give you my peace. Oh, um, you won't be missed out. Your mental health moments won't come and shut you down. Come on. To Christ, to Christ, to Christ, to Christ, to Christ. 
It's a second appeal that I want to make to those who, who know Jesus, but somehow you used to be deliberate in doing things, but now you become deliberately moving away from him. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Once you've been saved, you cannot be plucked out of the hands of Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. But there can be some moments of moving away because of life. There can be some moments that you move away because of time, because of situation and circumstances. But let me tell you, Jesus would never leave you. And wherever you left him, you can come back to him. He'll restore the joy of your salvation. He will restore that good thing in your life. He will restore the hand clapping moments. He will restore that deliberate position of life that you should always be in. Oh, come. He's waiting for you. Come on, come on, come on to Jesus Christ. To to Christ. Now let me tell you, that's a third appeal. One is salvation, the other one is restoration. The last one is shown up important. It is to unite with the body. And if that's your case today, we are Christ to you, oh my brother. He will, he will, he will give you a brand new life, new life, new life of mine. Just me, all you gotta do is come, oh, come. Just that you are weary, wounded, sad, come. Come, you who are weary, wounded, and sad. Away, but now walk back to him deliberately come you want to make this your church home come on i've tried it for myself and i know he's all right come on have you tried it for yourself ain't he all right have you trusted him for eternal life ain't he all right well just come to him Tell the Lord, thank you. How many of you received that word today? Yeah, he did it. Lord, have mercy, deliberately. And we're going to get a minute and a moment here. If you haven't done of your tithes and your offering, you're going to get a moment to do that. Those who have already done, as you be seated today, you can. Uh, you're going to get a chance to do that. And again, we haven't gotten to the point where we're coming back in and touching elbows and hands and giving out trays. But you have been doing exceptionally well, and that doesn't mean to stop doing it. Uh, it's amazing how God is blessing us as a result of being uh, trust, trustworthy with his, his resources. And those tithes and offerings are the things that keeps us going. And y'all, we've got to keep this in mind, that it is on that principle that God has been taking care of the Pleasant Grove Missionary Baptist Church family. It is God's taking care of us because we trust him with his, not only his tithe, but we trust him with his word and we trust him with his mission. And so I want to encourage you to continue to give. 
you give. Remember, they took clothes off and laid out to, to signify that they received Jesus as the king. Well, every time we give of ourselves in obedience, every time we give of ourselves, and we show homage to him. So if you haven't given and you have opportunity at the close of the service, uh, our ushers will lead you into that. And then as we prepare to leave this place, never from his pleasant presence, we're going to ask that you be mindful of those that are struggling. And let me just make known to you, uh, funeral services, this is already in the books for uh, Brother James, uh, Tony, uh, Tamara, and Alexander City. And um, I want to be praying for Clifford Tony. Uh, that he is now today transitioning his dad and remains uh, to the place where he abode for so many years. Uh, James was 83 years, and I thank God that we got we had two years and a half at least to know him, us who have been here through the pandemic time and discover something about James that he didn't let his situation get him down. He kept pushing. Now he's in the presence of Almighty God. So y'all be praying for the Tony family, and uh, please be mindful of that. Also, I want you to be praying for uh, Pastor Carl uh, Johnson, who, who passed the church there in Dolomite. Uh, he and I worked in the uh, fast food industry. He's still working. Uh, you guys brought me off and made me a, 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 a full time in that regard. I didn't have to work a secular job. Thank God for that. I think I don't even know what that would have been like having to continue to work a secular job and then pastor folks even through a pandemic situation. So I'm thankful and I'm grateful uh, for our church having the, uh, the foresight to do, uh, to set me free to do ministry. But uh, Reverend Carl Johnson uh, worked, he's, a, one of, he's the area man at, his, uh, at McDonald's. And if you ever been down on the Sixth Avenue, uh, side uh, when it was the old school uh, Burger King used to be down the street and we he and I was in competition uh, with that but then us we had a camaraderie hood when it comes to not only uh, fast food but with uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and so even with these jobs uh, one of his employees knocked him in the back of the head knocked him out he came to himself and and when he woke up and stood up, he hit him again, working at a fast food restaurant. I think about that. And I think about our own Daniel Johnson. He's working over there, and the, and the folks over there, they're crazy. They don't want to be at work. And, and the, part, the bad part of working in a restaurant, that they may not have getting not guns and bombs but they got knives and stuff that's already there so y'all want to be praying for Dr. Carl Johnson then when we think about those others who are going through some things in life I don't know you don't know when our day come but please let us be mindful to always pray for one another Sharice is going through it and she just chews a lot of time not to complain, and I thank God for her. But y'all keep on praying for Sharice. Keep on praying for her. She need encouragement. She don't need discouragement. And she don't need a lot of laying on hands. She just need to hear a word that I'm with you. Please don't tell her you know what she's going through. You don't. But you tell her you know a man named Jesus who knows everything. And are you having any situations here before we leave? Is there anything that's going on with you that you need to you need to make it known so that the church can pray? Remember in the olden day when the when the folks got in situation, they would come to the church and they would say, I need this or I'm going through this, and the church would pray about that. We still a praying church. And yes, we still are a hipping church. You don't have to go through what you're going through by yourself. Please be mindful of that. Catrice is going to come down and give us some uh, announcement. And as that music keep, got some pretty music, keep it going. Catrice, will you come and then I'll be right back. Thank you, Pastor Wells. If you pray the sinner's prayer, we welcome you to the body of Christ. We want you to connect to a Bible-based 
Christ-centered church. If that connection is here at The Grove, we welcome you to our church family. Connect with us by contacting us at 205-786-3351 so that we can celebrate in this moment with you and continue in this Christian journey together. It is now time for our tithes and offering as our pastor has stated. You can give now by cash app online using PayPal or if you're in person, you can use the baskets that are inside and outside of this worship center. We thank you so much for your support of this ministry with the giving of your finances, worshiping virtually, and coming back in person. The Bible Reading Marathon is returning to in-person reading. The marathon will take place at the Holy Cross Episcopal Church next to Veterans Memorial Park on Highway 11 in Trustful. The Grove is scheduled to read Friday, May 6th from 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. We need readers to sign up. Please contact Sister Estella Howard at 205-835-9588. You can contact Sister Verdell Boykin at 205-515-0703, or you can contact the church at 205-786-3351. Please sign up today so that we can have readers on May 6th. Take care of your spiritual, mental, and physical health. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in all things and circumstances, give thanks deliberately. Thank you and have a wonderful week. Amen, amen, amen. God bless your heart. Uh, let me show you how God is proactive. Sandra Lewis, y'all know Sandra Lewis? Her and Perry, you know, they got the flower, Sandy's flower shop. Anyway, uh, some time ago, uh, a few weeks ago, um, Sandra and uh, her husband was uh, travel was going to be traveling to a place, I think Atlanta, somewhere like that. But uh, he called and let me know that she fell sick. And he was telling me that uh, his character is that, yeah, you'll be okay. And that was, in the, you know, that's just the way he would just push right on. He said, but that day when she said that she was sick, he turned that car back around and went home. And it's good he did that because he had to end up taking her to the hospital. Her, her pressure was lowering. Her heart rate was, was going down. She had a stent placed in her chest some years ago that had failed because they'd been in her so long. And God proactively, deliberately saved her life. So we always should know that God is always ahead of us. And let's just be deliberate in our obeying him. And I want you to be praying for Reverend Kelly's mother. She, her pressure got up to 200 uh, over like 190 or something like that and had to rush her to the hospital. We was on Saturday morning, uh, Sunday school and and, uh, and so now she's at Brookwood, and the pressure is still up. Not as high, but it's still up. But her name is Margaret Kelly. I want you to be praying for that. Somebody said, well, I got stuff in my own life. Can I tell you, when you put other folks ahead of you in that regard, God already take care of your situation. Amen. Esteem others more than yourselves. Amen. Well, God bless your heart. Whatever you do this week, make sure you give God the praise and do it deliberately as you stand upon your feet. Amen. Father, we thank you and we bless your name today, Lord. Thank you for your word and thank you, God, that we don't allow the commerciality to come in and distort your message. Thank you, Lord, for that Palm Sunday that uh, you allowed your, your son to ride up, to ride into a situation to pay a price for our sins to be buried and raised the third day morning that we might live. Father, as we go, we do it deliberately. We praise your name. We seek your kingdom. We walk in your way and we hold on to your word. Thank you, Lord, as we leave this place. You're blessing us as we come in. Now, Lord, bless us as we go out that we become a blessing to those we come around. 
Help us to never fall prey to the deceptive practice of the enemy, for we know that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But thanks to you, O oh God, that you come that we might have life and have it abundantly. Now, Lord, we ask your blessings upon those names that we call out, those situations that are going forth. We pray, God, the blessings of you on them now, Lord, as we leave this place, never from your presence. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth and now forevermore. Lord, thank you now for these tithes and these offerings. Bless now, Lord, multiply, use it in whatever way you see fit. We do pray it all in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Shout amen, shout amen, shout amen. Remain standing if you happen to be in section one follow your leadership of your uh, usher and then go out and know that I love you and ain't nothing you can do about it. Section one. Amen.